Now I'm going to uh, provide a, a little summary of some of the refined earthenwares. Um, you might think of them sort of in a chronological continuum uh, from creamware to pearlware to whiteware, but in fact they actually overlap uh, to some degree. Whiteware is the next in this group of three of table and tea services. Like the other two, it's permeable. It has a pretty clear white paste, and its, its glazes, unlike pearlware, tend to be colorless. And so the white body shows through the colorless glaze, and it, it actually does look white. It was developed in the 18-teens in England um, and was first defined as ironstone around 1813. There's hundreds of formula for whiteware, and it's, it's mind-boggling how many improvements and changes were made. But it does have common characteristics um, with this white color. Oftentimes, it's a, it's a little bit harder than, than pearlware, and it's certainly much harder than, than creamware in terms of just the, the firing and the, and the nature of the, the body. The f different formulas come about because they added all different kinds of materials to it, uh, both for whitening but also for hardening and, and just to be able to, to make the vessels. Like the others, it's, it's an English development. It, it became a, a common import after the 1820s. And like pearlware, was subject to multiple decorative treatments, <clears throat> transfer printing, and now instead of just blue, there are many different colors that, of transfer printing that was applied. Hand painting, we'll talk about this in another session, that the hand painting changes from what you would see on, on pearlware uh, to smaller elements and uh, different colors, moving from the really dark earth tones of the early 19th century to, to more bright and almost pastel colors. Edge decorating continued, although it was blue and uh, like before, <clears throat> but the green edge decorating drops off and, and doesn't show up on, on uh, whiteware. Uh, annular decorations also occur, in other words, rings and then decorations within bands. By the 1850s and through the 1870s into the 1880s, mold decoration was really important. And these are, are either raised, embossed, floral, wheat, uh, other harvest designs that were imparted by the mold, <clears throat> or just the shape of the vessel uh, in kind of fluting or its edge, edges of the vessel uh, through mold decoration. And then finally through decal, or what's called decalcomania, where polychrome decals, often floral, were added over the glaze. These other decorative techniques, hand painting, transfer, edge decorating, are under the glaze. Because of its popularity and the huge amount of import, U.S. manufacturers uh, began to make this, and oftentimes it was English potters who came to the United States and set up factories, and um, we ended up having a lot of competition here. Probably the best known place of manufacture, although there were more than one, was East Liverpool, Ohio. Notice the name there. It probably developed in the late 1840s and was very extensive by the 1860s, and after the Civil War era, <clears throat> you'll see both English examples and uh, a lot of American examples being produced. We see huge amounts of whiteware on all of our 19th and early 20th century sites in the Midwest region. Any park where we've worked, any of the presidential homes, pictured rocks, town site of Old Munising, everywhere that we've excavated, if the site dates from the 1830 to early 20th century time period, you'll have large amounts of whiteware.